Hello, and welcome to the Drug Discovery World podcast, a podcast covering topics around drug discovery and development, pharma and biotech. My name is Giles, and I'm here to take you through this episode. Today's episode is taken from our spring 2018 issue, and is titled Disruptive Approaches to Accelerate Drug Discovery and Development, Part 1, Tools and Technologies. This article was originally published in two lengthy articles that are in two separate issues. So for the purposes of the podcast, we've decided to split these articles into three episodes in total. Part 1 will cover tools and technologies. Part 2, the core model. And Part 3, emergent intelligence. These articles were written by Ibis Sanchez Serrano, Dr. Tom Pfeiffer, and Dr. Ratnam Chagturu. And we'll tell you more about these authors at the end of part three. So now onto the main article. Disruptive Approaches to Accelerate Drug Discovery and Development, Part 1, Tools and Technologies. Tesla intends to implement and practice an open source philosophy to its large patent portfolio and claims it would not pursue any legal action against anyone using them in good faith. This is a hard pill to swallow for the industry at large. But the pharmaceutical industry ought to seriously consider such an inclusive strategy to enhance the pace of drug discovery and development for the benefit of humanity's welfare. The staggering failure rate of experimental drugs in clinical trials indicates that despite huge investments in novel technologies, Productivity gains in the pharmaceutical industry remain elusive. The pharmaceutical industry is facing a serious innovation deficit. The current biopharma model is therefore unsustainable, and disruptive approaches are needed to remedy the status quo. It is incumbent upon the biomedical research community to harness the collective intelligence of pharma, biotech, academia, governmental agencies, non-profit research foundations, and patient advocacy groups to accelerate innovation. Disruption, the force that both fuels and rises out of innovation, continues to affect every industry on the planet. For example, let's consider some recent breakthrough innovation models. Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, the world's most valuable retailer, owns no inventory. And Airbnb, the world's largest hotelier, owns no real estate. More recently, three large US corporations, Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and JP Morgan Chase, have announced the formation of an independent healthcare company for their employees in the United States to deal with the soaring cost of health insurance premiums and pharmaceuticals. So the question we have to ask is who actually drives innovation, the public or private sector. For more than half a century, it has been an article of faith that basic science would not get funded if the government did not do it, and economic growth would not happen if science did not get funded by the taxpayer. It may be a bitter pill to swallow, but the hard truth is that government funding of basic science was necessary because it is cheaper to copy than to do original research. Then, There are those who think there is less need for government to fund science, because industry will eventually do this itself. Having made innovations, it will then pay for further innovation. In reality, intellectual property rights through issued patents dampen innovation. The original rationale for granting patents was to encourage inventors to share their inventions, not just reward inventors with monopoly profits. A certain amount of this intellectual property law is plainly necessary to achieve this, but it has gone too far. Most patents are now as much about defending monopoly and deterring rivals as about sharing ideas, and that discourages innovation. However hard and bitter it may be, the pharmaceutical industry needs to consider following the example set by Elon Musk, for society's sake. Science drives technology, often resulting in patentable inventions. Invention leads to innovation. Both scenarios are inherently and fundamentally intertwined. For the betterment of humanity, it is imperative upon us, the Guardians, to see that science-driven inventions ultimately lead to technology-based innovations. 
While biotechnological advances, genomics and high throughput screenings, or combinatorial and asymmetric syntheses have long promised new vistas in drug discovery, the pharmaceutical industry is facing a serious innovation deficit. The costs of drug development have escalated, the number of drug withdrawals has increased to historic highs, and the transition from bench to bedside has been long and arduous. There are many reasons for this unsustainable business model. Most importantly, none of the pharmaceutical companies openly share the reasons for the failure of their clinical candidates in real time to effectively navigate the industry from committing the same mistakes. It is time for the pharmaceutical industry to embrace, metaphorically speaking, a community-driven, Wikipedia or ways type shared knowledge, openly accessible innovation model to harvest data and create a crowdsourced path towards a safer and faster road to the discovery and development of life-saving medicines. Pharma ought to give serious consideration to such a game-changing concept. Breakthrough innovations at the drug discovery front. It may seem at times that we are losing the battle against many of the diseases that inflict humanity. In reality, we have made great strides. We now live longer, with a life expectancy that has almost doubled over the last 150 years. Improvements in nutrition, sanitation and housing, combined with advancements in public health, including the use of prophylactic vaccines and antibiotics, have eradicated deadly diseases that claimed millions of lives across the globe. However, with changing lifestyles, new diseases are emerging. Age-associated comorbidities are increasing, and many old diseases still remain incurable. There are roughly 36 million deaths worldwide, attributable to non-communicable diseases. Our knowledge of disease modalities is expanding. Over the last decade, researchers, primarily academia and supported by public funds, have identified more than 1,000 new biological changes that could translate to new targets or biomarkers of disease and its progression. Genome-wide association studies have uncovered a multitude of gene variants that may be contributing to complex diseases such as schizophrenia, coronary artery disease, and diabetes. Unfortunately, the translation of many of these discoveries into therapeutics has not been realised. Limitations in capacity, funding, and even culture in an industrial setting make the selection of the best new therapeutic targets from the overwhelmingly large list unlikely. Altruistic role for pharma the pharma industry can help stimulate breakthrough on the discovery front. What if pharma's in-house facilities could become available for academic entrepreneurs, small biotechs, or other spin-offs looking for ready-set-up labs and just wanting access to equipment and bench space at cost? Tax breaks to the company could allow for this. Perhaps the more significant benefit is if the institution's programs being shut down, abandoned, or placed on the shelf could be viewed by small biotech and academic labs for the potential of gaining access in order to complement programs or research already ongoing in their not-so-cutting-edge labs. When business decisions often force pharma to shut down a mature program, it potentially allows interested academic researchers and small biotechs to utilise the knowledge to accelerate other related programs and could provide future benefits to pharma. One can consider this much like having an independent research group working on increasing the value of an asset that was deemed to be of little value, with no cost. Surely the possibilities exist that if 20 such project accesses were granted, perhaps one would provide returns and possibly a later stage program of significant value. A simple framework for this could be as simple as non-confidential summaries that could be put in a web-based storefront. Deals would have to be relatively simple, so as not to impede development of the technology or possible future business deals, perhaps with the farmer having a time-limited first rights for negotiation down the way. While the business case for the development of certain drug leads which have undergone a significant amount of preclinical and often clinical assessment may no longer be appealing to pharma, academia, foundations and non-profits may still find value and reposition or repurpose these fallen angels through their in-house programs starved of promising candidates. This, of course, requires that pharma does not attach strings that are arduous for the development path. 
We propose and seek an obligatory mandate by the FDA and other drug approval organizations for the promoting company to provide the unformulated drug for non-profit and academic uses. Open Science and Data Sharing The open science mantra has initiated some excitement of the possibilities of gaining a better grasp on science or data often hidden away behind locked doors, or just merely left on the lab bench to decay and rot. The concept behind open science is not new. Openly share results of preclinical discovery in hopes that the information will enable new ideas and concepts to emerge and push drug development forward. As it operates mostly in the preclinical space, it does not hamper drug development, but as proponents say, it will enhance it. The Montreal Neuroscience Institute, a working hospital and research institute, and partners have spearheaded such an endeavour in neuroscience, an area which has seen few new drug approvals and a drastic failure rate. But all areas of science could benefit from such an approach. Talking the talk is easy in this case. As everyone can say, we publish our results, so we are open science. However, walking the walk is a bit more challenging and will require new thoughts on how one really creates an open environment. Publication of results in a timely manner is one facet, but in reality, it happens only with failed research projects, or when the impact has fallen off the cliff. One of the biggest and perhaps most valuable aspects is also the inclusion and or publication of negative results. Think about it. Each year, billions of dollars are provided to academic labs to pursue ideas, and each year a large number of research papers are published. It is, however, rare to see the research that did not work. Yet, the same experiments are often carried out by other researchers who would have not travelled the path and wasted significant resources had they known. Negative data is good data to have, particularly as we move towards an era of employing artificial intelligence to enhance discovery and development. But how does one employ this in a world which only rewards positive results through publications and grants? One potential way would be to utilise a self-curated Wikipedia-like contribution which has some data entry standards employed to make the data easily searchable with respect to field, technology used, and results portrayed. Outsourcing To harness the best avenues possible in the most cost-effective way, pharmaceutical industry now actively pursues and outsources many of its activities and academic partnerships have become a key element of early pipeline strategies. When we outsource research, we risk losing serendipity and chance observations or findings that quite often fuel innovation and pave the path towards uncharted territories. For this not to happen, outsourced research projects must be managed actively, with an eye towards negative results and unexpected findings. Phenotypic and cell-based screening Along with phenotypic screening comes the challenge of identifying genes, proteins or compounds that can alleviate a syndrome. Previously, we have relied on SI-SHRNA knockdown to investigate which genes are necessary from an expression point of view with the hopes of uncovering potential targets for our compounds. Miniaturization of the technology, utilizing reverse transfection technology, has been able to provide the interrogation of thousands of genes via siRNA or CRISPR technologies on a glass slide that can easily be viewed by high content instruments. Persomics Incorporated has pursued this technology and once it becomes validated in the community, one can envision larger arrays covering the entire genome. If the phenotypic assay is run on one slide, one could quickly determine the effects of RNA expression on assay readouts and this would perhaps lead one to be able to identify pathways which would be appropriate to drug. With the advance of CRISPR technologies, this has become simpler and perhaps more practical in that genes are knocked out providing a clearer picture of protein involvement in a disease. CRISPR CRISPR, clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, has revolutionised the way we do discovery biology. This exquisite technology comes from a bacterial defence mechanism used to destroy invading DNA. 
The small DNA repeats in the bacterial genome, producing short RNAs, which recognize and bind to the invading DNA, while bringing the DNA cleavage enzyme Cas9 to its location to cut the DNA so it becomes ineffective, while ensuring a copy of the short piece of invading DNA is reproduced and inserted into the bacterial genome to ensure memory of this invading species. Since 2013, CRISPR technology has generally replaced other gene editing or modifying systems due to its precise and efficient abilities. Examples include knocking out specific genes in cells and in animals, gene editing of human embryos to correct mutations, as well as extraction of HIV from a living organism, thus preventing the progression of a latent infection. As we delve more and more into the disruption of protein-protein complexes to create a newer generation of drugs, we need to be aware that a knockout, KO, of that protein may not provide compelling proof of target validation. Quite often, a KO is lethal, causing drug developers to drop the target, unless your field is oncology. But in other fields, it is not a KO that is required, but more of an inhibition of an interaction with a neighbouring protein that is critical to prevent the disease or outcome. By modulating that interaction, one could have created a therapy. But once again, the challenge is very often protein-protein interactions, and often these surfaces do not have big pockets or clefts for a small molecule to bind into. The question is still out as to how to do this. CRISPR may provide a potential answer. Recently, Salk scientists have adapted the CRISPR mechanism to modulate expression of genes rather than knock them out. They have done this by utilising a defective Cas9 which cannot cleave but can still target the gene specificity by the appropriate guide RNA. Thus, there is the ability to turn genes off and on at the transcriptional level, which enables a number of key experiments that drug developers have been wishing for. The ability to modulate components of a protein complex without having to clone all of the genes involved. This next round of CRISPR reagents will have a profound effect on how we look at altering gene expression with the abilities for turning genes on or off, or to potentially disrupt a translation of a portion of a protein. By removing specific domains of proteins, we can better learn the full potential of drugging them and hopefully zero in on the regions of interactions that are critical. Genetic modalities Genetics is often the route chosen for target identification and validation a result of Genome-Wide Association Studies, GWAS, linking certain genetic variants or mutations to disease condition, or having a direct biomarker in the gene causing the disease. While we utilise the results of genome-wide sequencing data and incorporate gene expression data within the rationale for pursuing drug discovery efforts of specific pathways and proteins, the use of genetics to aid in finding a cure is often left behind. Compensatory mutations that can rescue the original mutation is an area of genetics that has been the focus in model organisms for quite some time. Its possible application to drug development adds another avenue to consider when searching for a disease-modifying drug. Can a drug against a protein in another pathway solve or prevent the condition caused by the original mutation? A similar approach has been harnessed in drug development for cancers, synthetic lethality or in the drug development world, chemical lethality, as a means of selectively destroying cancer cells. In this case, the cancer cells have a mutation which in part is responsible for their phenotype. When this mutation is combined with another mutation, which also by itself has no effect on the cell, the cell is doomed, hence being synthetic lethal. Finding compounds that cause this effect are a potential source of new drugs and a new mechanism of action for treating cancers. If two mutations can work together to provide lethality, could the reverse not also be true? Synthetic health. This approach would seek non-related mutations which cure the phenotypic disease, or at least slow it down. This strategy could also be used in drug combination types of approaches and creation of chimeric compounds. Death of a dogma. CDS and ORFs. 
In the world of big data, it is often useful to remind ourselves as to how data is being analyzed and ask ourselves to go back and visit the bioinformatics algorithms applied and the curated data generated. What was relevant and cutting edge then may not be so now with our ever expanding knowledge base. Years ago, this fault was demonstrated in the RNA world as we became aware of siRNAs being important in both gene regulation and mRNA stability and translation, and more recently, with exosomal RNA, RNA transported via exosomes to other cells and SNORNAs. Now we see the same with proteins. In the early days of genomics and bioinformatics, one mRNA coding sequence, CDS, was considered to be associated with only one protein coding gene. But now we know that eukaryotic mRNAs contain not a single REF CDS, but usually several ORFs. The single CDS dogma has artificially limited our view of the coding capacity of mRNAs, and has prevented the discovery of alternative proteins, despite some clues in the literature over the years. Functional relationships between reference and alternative proteins expressed from the same gene may help identify a new layer of regulation of protein activity. Previously, the definition of a protein was classically defined as a stretch of 100 plus amino acids with a start and stop codon, with some minor variations. The algorithm has broadly been used to identify the number of proteins in the genome of just about every organism sequenced. Of course, variations of these parameters have been made, but back in the 80s. With the limited knowledge available, it made sense. However, Today, it is becoming increasingly apparent that one has to closely look at our definition of a protein. Spearheaded out of the University of Sherbrooke by the Ruku lab, the ALT protein analysis of the genome has lowered the requirement of a protein to 30 amino acids. The protein coding potential of eukaryotic mRNAs has surely been underestimated. It has already demonstrated that another body of knowledge around possible targets for drug discovery is becoming relevant, and will provide a treasure trove of knowledge for future drug discovery scientists to think about, and perhaps revisit fallen programs where knockout data confirmed an interaction, but drugging the protein never provided the anticipated results. Lots of rationale of why the drug may not have worked, but perhaps the wrong protein was drugged. What if it was an alt protein responsible for the effect? Biologicals Monoclonal antibodies are the hot topic of pharma industry, as these drug approvals are picking up, and the ability to utilize them in CRAT and other technologies is gaining momentum. The roots of creating and selecting these monoclonals has diverse streams. However, the common one from academia is the creation of a mouse MAP using hybridoma methodology as a starting point. While this has produced great tools for biology, and sometimes is the starting point for development of a humanized version for drug development, we now realize that this is a tricky and complicated development path involving time-consuming screening for the right potency, selectivity, and humanized lead. In the past few years, the idea has emerged to begin with fully human, not mouse, antibodies as the starting point to alleviate some of the challenges of developing drug candidates. Much like the chemists have defined useful backbones for compound drug development, biologists have now defined a number of scaffolds based on those that have been in phase one, and combined that with V regions and alleles that are shared by all human populations. Along with selecting specific CDR regions, and creating a diversity of 76 billion antibodies allows for quick selection of monoclonal antibodies with high specificity and good clinical perspective. This Bio Superhuman Library 2.0, a synthetic monoclonal antibody library, claims to reduce monoclonal lead discovery and development to about two months. And that is the end of part one of our three-part series Disruptive Approaches to Accelerate Drug Discovery and Development. In part two, we will be discussing the core model, and part three, emergent intelligence. These articles were written by Ibis Sanchez-Serrano, Dr. Tom Pfeiffer, 
and Dr. Ratnam Chogaturu. I'll be giving more detail on the author's backgrounds at the end of part 3. If you've enjoyed this episode, then as always you can subscribe to the journal free of charge by visiting our website ddw-online.com, where you can also view all of our old articles and PDFs, including references and figures and images. You can find the links to the article for this episode in the show notes. If you've enjoyed the podcast, then we'd massively appreciate you leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, and you can also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Thank you for listening, and we'll hope to see you in our next episode. <laughs>